If you have your Bibles this morning, like I said, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to give, you know, I want to go back through it just a few minutes and help lay out the thought. It's good for my soul. Hopefully it's good for your soul because there's just one flow all the way through this text that we've been talking about in all of these chapters. And it deals with the wisdom of God. First of all, it was the wisdom of God and the message of God. So look down at your Bibles in 1 Corinthians. I didn't put this up here for you. I just want to go through this for me. The wisdom of God was displayed in the message of God. And you see that in the very first chapter in verses 21 through 24. Let me read this. It says, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so we see the wisdom of God in the message from God. But we also see the wisdom of God in the makeup of the church. And here's my point as I go through all these. You need to know that the wisdom of God drives everything. He didn't invite us along so we could bring something to the table. He didn't invite us along to say, Joey, what do you think about this? Will you help me out? No, no. I've got nothing to offer the Lord. If I will simply humble myself to His Word and His wisdom, then my life can bear fruit. So it's not just in the message of God. It's in the makeup of the church. Look again in chapter 1, verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world, the despised, God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. So in the makeup of the church, God chose that the people of the church would not be very impressive according to worldly standards. Thank God. Thank God. If you're ever ashamed because you feel like you're nothing to this world, thank God. Because those are the sort of people that God has poured himself forth into. The makeup of the church was according to the wisdom of God. The world is concerned about exactly opposite than what God is. So it's not just the message, it's not just the makeup, but God's wisdom is also supposed to be displayed in the ministry of the church. Paul gives us an example in chapter 2. Look what he says in 1 through 5. When I came, brothers, I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul says, even the ministry of the church, my ministry, is based on God's wisdom. And he's not talking about when he says superiority of speech, he's not talking about, I just came to you with just simple old country language. I wasn't trying to impress. He's not talking about that. If you think he is, just read the rest of the book of Corinthians because it'll leave you scratching your head. There's some deep truth in here. What he's talking about is, I relied fully on the message that I was given and it was Christ crucified. And when I preached it, I preached in fear and trembling fully dependent upon God. I knew that there was nothing in me that could ever change a man, but the Spirit of God can. And so I, in prayer and in fasting and in brokenness, I preach God's message. So the wisdom of God is driving everything here. It's the message of the church. It's the makeup of the church. It's the ministry of the church. Everything relies upon the wisdom of God. So when we get to chapter 3, Things have run aground. The church at Corinth and the church today, y'all, if there's anything in Scripture that we've passed through in the last year and a half, this is it, that speaks to the church today. We as a whole have rejected the wisdom of God and we run the church according to the wisdom of the world. Corinth had done that. And it began to show up in big ways. 
Paul, very, very, you know, they begin to put emphasis in men. We talked about this last week. It began to show up in jealousy and strife. They begin to compare one to another. And in this section we're going to walk through here, even the things that they were doing in the church, they were using gimmicks. They were using pragmatism. We'll talk about that. They were using those sort of things to guide the church. Let me just stop and talk about that now. You know what pragmatism is? Very simply, you look at results... You take what works, and then you implement that. It works great in a business. It works really good if you're trying to grow a business or make profit. Find out what works, and then just put that in your business. We figured out in a pharmacy, if you learn people's name when they walk in your store and call them by their first name, they will come back. So we made it a real strong effort to say, Hey, Johnny, how you doing when he walked in the store? I'd even put a note in the computer. He's married to Sheila. How's your wife, Sheila? It works. That's pragmatism. You put those things into your business. But don't dare bring that junk into the church. And if the church has done anything today, it has grown so pragmatic. They're trying to figure out what works to grow the church, and they're putting that junk in the church. This is not a business. It cannot be run like you run the world. This is the family of God And if you're going to do it at all and bear fruit for His glory, you better do it by His wisdom and His wisdom alone. And so Paul is trying to teach them this. This is very practical as we walk through these things. And so let's look at this in verse 5 through 9. I got it up already for you. Let me read through it and then we'll walk back through it. Paul says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, But God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. Now here it is. You're in a mess. And I would say this to the churches today. You're in a real mess. You've turned your back on the wisdom of God. You're operating the church according to the wisdom of the world, and you're in a real mess. So how do we get out of the mess? Do you turn to the world and say, okay, what does the world offer to get us out of the mess? We even do that. We get ourselves in a mess, and then we look to the world to see what will work to get us out of the mess. Paul says here, I'll teach you according to the wisdom of God. Number one, you need to change your perspective about what you think about others in the church. Remember I told you when we first started this, it does no good to change your attitude, I mean your actions, until we change your attitude. Until you change the way that you think, you will never really change the way that you act. If you change the way that you think, you will change the way that you act. Do you understand that? It's just like anything from the world. Think about it. People smoke their whole life, right? Until one day they walk in a doctor's office and the doctor tells them they got cancer and all of a sudden, most of them, they have a whole different perspective about smoking and they'll lay them down. It's different. It's the same with us and these sort of spiritual things. Until we change the way that we think, we are not going to change the way that we act. And Paul says, number one, you need to change the way that you perceive other people. And number two, you need to change the way that you think about God. And five through nine, he walks through all of these. Okay? So let's walk, let's walk through and look at this. Now, I did this for my sake. It may not necessarily help you. But when we walk through this passage, I'm going to go through this twice because he speaks about other people and he speaks about God. When we go through it and we're speaking about other people, I want to talk about two things. Number one is identity. You need to learn how to identify yourself and others. And it is a very humbling thing to see this in these passages. But number two, he cleans that up for us and he says, but you need to also realize about opportunity. So we're going to walk through this and we're going to see identity and opportunity. But look at this first. I hope this thing works this morning. What then is Apollos and what is Paul? You are servants. Now some of your translations have changed this word. Instead of what, some of you have got the word who. 
because they said, well, they said they, he's using names, so the, really, the text really shouldn't have said what. The text should have said who then is Apollos and who is Paul. But that's the whole point here. Paul is saying you're putting emphasis on who, but God puts emphasis on what. It's not a who in the church of God. It's a what. The world is concerned about your name and who you are. God is concerned about what you are. And in the church, we are all servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no difference among us. Do you understand that? The world loves titles. The world loves positions. And we've brought all that junk right into the church. I'll pick on somebody else instead of Southern Baptist for a change. Pope. There's a Pope. There's a Cardinal. There's all kinds of positions of hierarchy. And none of that belongs in the church. We've brought in deacon, elder, chairman of the deacons, pastor, lead pastor. I'm sorry, it doesn't belong in the church. We're all servants in the Lord Jesus Christ, period. God says you need to rethink who you are. You're putting so much emphasis on position and you've missed the point. You're all servants. Now this word, let me clean this up this bit. This word right here, let me go back. You remember this word? We've been preaching on it for several months. Anybody remember how to pronounce that? Diakonos. Now, diakonos later in Scripture becomes the word deacon, but Paul's not there yet. This is one of his earliest, earliest letters. We've seen the, the, the term before, and it was in the book of Acts, and this is what that term meant in the book of Acts. Table waiter. Paul says, you want to refer to yourselves as something in the church, you pastors, you church leaders, you deacons, you elders, then call yourself table waiters. That is what you are. You're putting so much emphasis on individuals and you're nothing but table waiters. I'm telling you, that is all I am. I did not prepare the meal this morning. I did not write the menu. God didn't ask me, Joy, what do you think needs to be on the menu this morning? He said, son, it's been prepared. Just take it and put it on the table. Amen. That is it. And as leadership in the church, that's all we're doing. You tie an apron around your waist and you come to church and you wait tables, especially you men in leadership. I had a friend of mine preach a similar message like this. And one of the ladies actually made aprons for all the men, Miss Burma, and brought them to the pastor. And she said, these are for your men. And he said, you get it. He said, men, put these on. You get it. You know, not too long ago, Audrey and Abby and I went to one of the Auburn game, basketball games. It's when... Uh, Classes weren't in, so we got really good seats. We got to sit on the floor of the basketball game. So we're sitting down there right on the floor, you know, enjoying the basketball game, and in walks Gus Malzahn. And so I told Audrey, I said, get your cell phone, run over there, and go, can we have a selfie? And take a picture real quick with you and Abby, and get Abby to sneak up behind him on the other side. So she went over there, and she just asked him, can we get a picture made with you? And he's like, Sure. So both girls got down and took her picture. That's fun. That's the world. But that doesn't belong in the church. Let me tell you a sad story. A few months ago, Paige and I got to go to a preaching uh, conference. It was one of the best I've ever been to. David Platt was there. David, David preached. David did a good job. Pretty good, pretty good speaker. I wish he would... Honest with you, being a little more expository, he's a little too topical for me, I guess you'd say. But he does a great job. There were 7,000 men there. When he finished preaching, dozens and dozens of young pastors went down there to get a selfie made with David Platt. 
And I'm like, what are you doing? We are servants of God. We are not special. We are not unique. We are not rock stars. And if we don't stop putting emphasis on individuals in the church, we'll never glorify God. We've got to understand this. The person sitting on your right and on your left, we're all one in Christ. And don't you dare ever think about taking a leadership position in the church until you understand that one truth. Because you will kill the family of God by stepping up. That's the humbling part. It gets better. <laughs> Here's the good part. Look at this. This is crazy. Your servants, yes. But oh my goodness. Do you know who you serve? You serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And no one comes to faith. Listen, according to Romans, no one comes to faith apart from the preaching of the Word of God. That's the way God has decided. No one will ever come to faith apart from the preaching of the Word of God. And guess who He called to preach? The church. Your servants, yes, but your servants of the King that has been trusted with the only thing that can breathe eternal life into the soul of a man. You think about this. What if you, just think about this from a morally perspective. What if you said, somebody said, what, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a, I'm a personal aide. They are, okay. Does that mean kind of like you're a gopher boy? And you say, well, yeah, in fact, I'm a gopher boy, I guess. They would laugh to themselves, right? And they say, well, you know, I guess that's an important job, being a gopher boy. Who are you a gopher boy for, by the way? And you say, the President of the United States. It's not so funny anymore, is it? Now, I know things would be different if we had a different president right now, but you get the drift, right? I'm an aide. I carry coffee to somebody every day and hold their notebook and pen. Oh, that's not a very impressive job. Oh, well, yeah, I do that, but I do that for the President of the United States. That's a little more impressive. Your servants, and that's all you'll ever be in this lifetime, but you are servants for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And nobody will ever come to faith apart from the grace of God flowing through the servants of God. Man, that ought to thrill your soul. They can't come to faith unless God's grace flows through you to get to them. What a job. I mean, I used to hate God. I rejected God. That's what Scripture says. We all did. We despised God. We went the other way. You say, no, I didn't. I'll say, well, I can show you in Scripture. Yes, you did. You were committed to your own way and your own self. And God in His grace came to you in deadness and sin and called you to Himself. That's what Scripture says. And He turned you around. And the one that despised Him, He said, not only did I call you in love, but through you, I'm going to use you to preach the gospel to lost people so that they can be saved. Why did he choose to do it that way? I have no idea. But that's exactly what our Father did. You're a servant, yes, but nobody comes to faith. Through you, the church, they believe. Let me give you something else. And the Lord gave opportunity to... Who? Each one. Everybody in this house, everybody in the church of God has opportunity given by God through whom others believe. We think it's just this preaching thing, but oh, it's not. It's, it's all of us. We move and we breathe as one. 
through whom God uses grace. Let's, let's play around with this. Let's just say Eddie over here gets arrested for jaywalking, okay? Eddie's got to spend 21 days in sections prison for jaywalking. Well, Sandra finally feels sorry for him and starts carrying a pot of pintos and cornbread. She's shaking her head. No, <laughs> never happened. <laughs> Sandra finally starts day 20, brings him a pot of pintos and some cornbread. And she brought enough for the jailer. She gives some to the jailer, the guy who arrested Eddie for 21 days for jaywalking. And he eats, and he was really appreciative of that. And he learns that, by the way, she went to Corinth Baptist Church. So this guy, a jailer, he's new, and he's moved to the community. And this is his first exposure to anybody in this area. And it was pinto beans and, cor and cornbread from somebody he had in prison. Well, before long, his water line breaks. No, Chris Hancock is walking by. He hops out of his truck. He's late for probably two kids' ball games and something for his wife and a men's retreat. <laughs> he came, but he just left early, okay? But Chris stops the truck, and he gets out, and he fixes the water line. Takes care of the whole thing. And that old boy and his family find out that old Chris goes over to Corinth. He sends his kids to school, and they start going down at Macedonia, and they start meeting, meeting some of these teachers, like Marla, and Johnny, and the rest of you, Melissa, down at Macedonia. And they have a very unusual way of caring for their kids and loving their kids. And they just see something unique in them, too, and they find out they go down to Corinth. And they come to church. Madeira's got their kids. Madeira takes good care of their kids. They find out she comes here all the time. You see how we all preach the gospel? You see how it is all of us? You know what? The old boy may come in here and he may sit down and he go, man, if I hate anything, I hate ball-headed preachers. <laughs> and he goes over to First Baptist in section and Edward preaches the gospel and he comes to faith in Christ and he joins First Baptist. Have we failed? Oh, no. Not at all. We were servants through whom he believed. And we had opportunity. And we jumped on it with both feet. And God was gracious. And he adopted somebody into his family. We're servants, yes. But we all have opportunities that just about knock us down sometimes. We just have to be faithful to walk in them. Let's keep going. He goes on with more. What time is it, by the way? How are we doing? We're okay. He goes on with some more of this. I planted a Paul's water, but God was causing the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is what? anything. Um, this is something the church has forgotten today. In fact, look what he says. The one who plants and the one who waters are one. I was driving to Huntsville the other day and I was listening to Caleb. I don't ever listen to the radio. Caleb's our local Christian station or whatever and I just flipped it on and I was listening to it and a guy came on with his ministry. And I was thinking about these passages, you know, we're, we're nothing compared to God, right? God gets all the glory. We may plant, we may water, but compared to God, we're nothing. We're servants, His servants. 
This is what this guy said for his ministry. This was his big deal. He says, you be all that God has designed you to be. Who's the, where's the emphasis in that statement? You are. He even said it twice. You be all that God has designed you to be. Does that sound anything like Scripture? What's Paul saying in Galatians 2.20? For I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, yet Christ lives in me. What did the Lord Jesus say? For I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. What did John the Baptist say? Remember John the Baptist, he's baptizing guys and his prophets, his followers come to him and says, John, John, Jesus is baptizing more people than you. John, you're going to have to do something. You remember what John said to his disciples or his followers when they came to him? He must become greater and I must become less. So where's the positive side of this? Let me show you in verse 8. It says, now he who plants and he who waters are one. You know, I was, when I was thinking about this, we have one goal, right? And by the way, I'm about to get to our reward. But right now I want to talk about this. We're one. Listen, I saw it this morning. And it made me cry when we were singing. Um, Sandra played. And Hannah stood behind her and sang. And then Sandra got up. Hannah sat down and played. And Sandra stood up behind her and sang. They took turns playing. They took turns singing. And they worshipped together in unity. That's not always been the case in this church. And I have prayed about it. I didn't know what to do about it. But God in His grace has moved in it. And He's brought it together to help them realize we are doing the same thing here. We are leading a church in worship. We are moving as one. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us serving together and moving as one. And we're starting to understand that. It blesses your pastor's heart because that's what we're supposed to be in the body of Christ. It's not about preferences and opinions. It's just about us being together as one in the body of Christ. And I love it when I see it. He goes on to say, each one will receive. Now he separates us. You ready? Look at this. Look at all these words. Each receive his own reward according to his own labor. We move as one. We are the body of Christ. We are servants of Christ. Same goal, same aim. We're all doing the same thing in different ways. Totally different ways. I can't fix the roof, but David can. I don't know anything about cows, but we got some guys in here that do. They can help you with that. I have no idea how to teach your children, but there's a lot of people in here that do. We've all got different things we're doing, but if when we all get on the same page, we're one, but... There will be a day when you, yourself, stands before God. And let me tell you what's on the table. Your reward. Now it is not, hear me, hear me well, it is not based on your salvation. That has nothing to do with this. There is reward on the table for you now. Do you know how that is received? Look at what the passage says. According to your own labor. If you remember, back up in verse 5, 
the Lord has given opportunity to each one. And you'll stand before God one day and you'll say, I gave you opportunity to speak the gospel into people's lives. Now listen, hear me well, because we're not going to have time this morning. I already see that. It's not based on results. You need to know that. The church today has gone nuts with numbers and results. I get sick of reporting things to baptisms and, and VBS numbers. And the church is just consumed with worldly measurements and worldly standards. Your reward is not based on that. God's not going to say, well, how many came to faith with your preaching? If he did, you know what we could say? Well, how many came to faith with Noah's preaching? Because Noah preached for 100 or 120 years. It's debatable. He preached the gospel for 100 years. How many people came to faith with Noah's preaching? Zero. There's a, you know, we've been talking about praying about going to Myanmar and Burma. Guy went there in the late 1700s. A, a Dinaram? A Donaram Judson. He preached the gospel for 12 years in Myanmar. You know how many converts he had? 18. 18 people. 12 years he preached. It's not based on results. Your reward is not based on how many people got baptized, how many people prayed a profession of faith. It's not based on that. It's based on your faithfulness to your labor. God, go back up in verse 6. Who causes the growth? God causes the growth. Look at verse 7. Neither one who plants nor the one who waters anything, but God who causes the growth. He's the only one that brings results. We'll talk about next week how the church is trying to take this job away from God and they're trying to bring their own results. But true results only come from God. Your reward is based on your faithfulness to your labor. And don't sit there and say, oh, I haven't had opportunity. I'll say, yes, you have. Read verse 5. This is how we need to, we need to look at each other. We're servants. That's it. No titles. No levels of hierarchy. We have one authority. It's not me. This is it. This is our authority. We're all servants. But we're servants to the king, and he has chosen that through us, the gospel will move. Through the church of God, the gospel will move. And he has called all of us to have the same goal, to have the same aim, to function as one and let that gospel move through our lives in every opportunity given us by God. But we'll all stand before God one day and we will be held accountable for the opportunities that we had to speak the gospel into people's lives. Now let me ask you, what are you doing with the opportunities you have? Are you being a faithful laborer for the kingdom of God? Or are you letting opportunities pass before you? Let's pray.